Let's cultivate our motivation. Sometimes when we say all sentient beings, it uh, becomes kind of a nondescript blur. <clears throat> and it's easy to say, you know, oh, I'll lead all sentient beings to awakening. But it's, it's much more valuable to, to really think, start out thinking of specific people and cultivating love for them, compassion for them, you know, and then slowly broadening our scope. So, for example, to look around the room and think, okay, I'm going to lead so-and-so to liberation, and I'm going to lead that one to liberation, this one to liberation, and, you know, go one by one to everybody in the room and think, you know, they've been kind to me in the past. They're kind to me now. They'll be kind to me in the future. I have this fortune to have this rebirth, so may I use it to be a benefit to others, starting with these people who are sitting right around me right now with all their problems, all their idiosyncrasies, Uh, and and really think of no matter what it takes, no matter how much they resist or what they say to me or what they think of me, now I'm committed to leading them to awakening. So start with the people around and then expand it, expand, expand it outwards. And then really make the commitment no long no matter how long it takes, there's really nothing else to do in samsara but attain awakening and benefit sentient beings. I mean, what else are we gonna do? And there's only so many beaches we can lay on, so much chocolate we can eat eat so many relationships we can have. But let's try something new, like practicing the path, and see if that will remedy our difficulties. And so with the mind that's eager to learn the Dharma, then let's share in the teachings this evening. So in approaching the Buddhist path, we're on the chapter that's called the systematic approach. And so last week we talked about some of the different ways of setting out the path. We talked about Aryadeva's verse and two ways to understand it. We talked about the ornament for clear realization and how it set, sets out the topics we talked a little bit about the gradual path. 
And we also uh, talked about who these different texts were written for and that the great masters try to uh, set out the path for specific audiences in terms of, uh, you know, are those audiences Buddhist or not? What's the um, interest and disposition of the people who are listening and so on? Okay. So we talked about that last time. Then this week... We're talking about um, the value of the stages of the path. So what, what's the benefit of studying? Um, here it says the stages of the path. But it could actually be any of the different uh, ways, any of the systematic approaches, you know. Are you devas, ornament of clear realizations? It's, it's really the value of a systematic approach that includes all the different topics uh, in the path, all the different points that are important for us to understand. Okay? So as Holiness says, the Lamrim's gradual systematic approach to the path has many advantages. So these all come at the beginning of the Lamrim texts. Yeah, they're all there. Whether you remember them or not, they're there. Okay. So the first one is we will see that the Buddha's teachings are not contradictory. So if we compare the Buddha's advice to various disciples, his, his advice to various disciples, we may think he contradicted himself. In some sutras, the Buddha said there is a self. In others, he spoke of selflessness. In some scriptures, he spoke of the importance of abandoning alcohol. In others, he allowed it in particular rare circumstances. Okay. So these differences occur because the Buddha guided sentient beings with vastly different dispositions and tendencies and all these disciples were also at different levels of the path. Okay. So if you think of ordinary school, you know, what you how you teach somebody in first grade is going to be different than how you teach, you know, math in first grade and math in seventh grade and math, you know, at a senior high school and math when you're in college. You know, it's the same topic, but how you teach it is, is going to be very, very different um, because it's different people, or even if it's one person, it's at different stages of that person's life and uh, when they're at different, have, they have different levels of knowledge. So the Buddha's motivation was the same in all these instances where he talks to all these different people. <clears throat> which was to benefit the person and to gradually lead him or her to awakening. So that's his consistent motivation throughout. Okay, To fulfill this purpose, he tailored his instructions to suit the current capacity of each disciple. Saying that a self exists uh, was a skillful way to guide people who fear selflessness. So some people, when they hear, oh, you know, there's, there's no solid self, they totally freak out and get afraid. Like, there's no me, then who exists? And, you know, I, I don't exist at all, and how can that be? And does that mean at death that there's complete nothingness? And those people really get afraid. So, and that kind of fear really blocks them from understanding the Dharma because their mind is just totally taken over by that kind of unreasonable fear. Okay, Of course, they think it's quite reasonable fear, just like we were talking this afternoon. Whenever we're in the middle of something, we think it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Later, um, when, they, when these same people were more spiritually mature, the Buddha clarified that there is no inherently existent self. Okay? So, you know, before he said, oh yeah, there is a self, don't freak out, 
that there's, you know, there's nothing. And then he stepped it up later and said, oh, there's no inherently existent self. Okay, but there, you know, there is a self, but not an inherently existent one. Okay, and then, so similarly, for the vast majority of people, consuming intoxicants harms their spiritual practice and should be given up. For highly accomplished chantra practitioners who have renunciation, bodhicitta, and the wisdom realizing emptiness, consuming a small amount of alcohol may benefit their meditation in particular circumstances. Did you notice how many conditions were in that sentence? <laughs> okay. Highly accomplished tantric practitioners, yeah, who have renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view. So it's not just anybody who says, I'm practicing tantra. It's not just anybody who has a rudimentary understanding of the three principal aspects of the path. Okay, Consuming a small amount of alcohol, not a whole bottle, okay, may benefit, not will benefit, their meditation in particular circumstances, not all the time. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, just, I'm in a storytelling mood today, so I'll tell you another story. Uh, so Alex Burson was in Seattle teaching. This was, oh my goodness, like maybe around, uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe around 1989, something like that. So Alex and I are old friends. So he was invited by uh, a Nyingma group to give teachings, and I went, and he taught, and it was soak day, so afterwards they set up for soak, and, you know, we did soak, and then they're passing everything out, and, you know, I'm, I'm a nun, it's very clear, and uh, anyway, they give everybody there a glass of alcohol this big, yeah, and Alex and I kind of look at each other, and it's like, what in the world is going on here? Okay. And we asked, and they said, oh, well, this is the way we do it in our tradition. And we said, well, it's not the way we do it in our tradition, <laughs> where you just dip, dip your finger in and have one drop that you, you know, put here. And they were so shocked, you know, so shocked that we uh, just rejected the alcohol they gave. Yeah? So, uh, you know, this is a sign of, I think, a lot of misunderstanding, you know, that people have about Tantra and Tantra practices. Yeah? In, in another situation, I uh, had a friend in a Galu group uh, where there was somebody, some guy from out of town who, you know, had been practicing and he came in and they all did soak. And again, you know, they, they started pouring alcohol for everybody. And my friend told me, is that possible? You know, is that what we do in, in our tradition? And somehow, um, you know, she said, well, it's all the people who took uh, ordination, not ordination, initiation, empowerment with this certain lama, and they're doing the soak, and this other guy came and said, this is how you do it. And I said, mm, I don't think so. So uh, I sent a message to the lama who had given the uh, empowerment, and I said, there are students who think that this is okay to do, um, you may want to clear it up. And so sure enough, next time he went to that place, he gave it to them. <laughs> you know, I mean, he really told them, uh, you know, that's, that's not what we do. That's not part of uh, how we practice Tantra. Because mm -hmm. we're not qualified disciples. Yeah. And uh, His Holiness, once talking about that, he was saying, there's maybe mm, one handful of people who can do consort practice. 
But there are also people who usually give up their ordination so as not to create any confusion in other people's minds. Okay. So anyway, there's a lot of confusion about Tantra in the West. Um, and maybe in Tibet as well. So just uh, be aware of it and uh, know what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do and keep to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. This advice is not contradictory. Okay, the advice to, you know, like with the fifth precept to stop taking intoxicants and then for those rare people in particular circumstances who have high realizations a little bit, okay? So he's saying this advice is not contradictory because the Buddha's motivation is the same in both cases. If a person, um, and he gives an example, if a person walking on a narrow lane with precipices on both sides is too close to the left precipice, a skillful guide will call out, go right, <laughs> okay? But if she's too close to the right precipice, the guide will direct, go left. So taken separately, these may seem to be contradictory instructions. However, when we understand the context and the long-term purpose, we see there is no contradiction and only benefit, okay? So again, we talked about uh, a few weeks about uh, about Lama, but Lama says, and but Lama says different things to different people. Okay, so we can't take the advice for one person and necessarily apply it to everybody. Okay. Not only does the Buddha give different teachings for different individuals. His advice to one person will vary according to the circumstance at different times, depending on the distortions most prominent in that person's mind. Initially, someone may conceive of the self as a permanent, unitary, and dependent soul, in which case the Buddha will teach how to refute such a self. Okay, so just the permanent a unitary independent one. He'll refute that one, but not all kinds of self, not all notions of self. Yeah, because it's just that particular one that that person's grasping onto. If at another time in her practice she uh, conceives of the external world as independent from perception, the Buddha will teach the Chitta Madra view that there is no external world distinct from the mind to help her dissolve that false grasping. So according to, you know, what's really going on in our mind, uh, you'll get different advices. Uh, so, for example, if you remember when we um, studied the 400 by Aryadeva, he was saying if a person has a lot of anger, you know, be gentle with them, don't be too strict. But if a person has a lot of attachment, make them work very hard, okay? So if at one time somebody is, you know, just like lazing around and full of attachment and indulgent, then the teacher may say, okay, you have to do this project and this project and get going, okay? But later on, if that same uh, disciple is, let's say, being really angry, then the teacher may let up a little bit and say, okay, take a long walk, relax your mind, you know, something like that. Yeah. So that so the, the advice you get is going to be d different according to different people and according to different circumstances. Okay, so that's important to remember. Otherwise, uh, we think, oh, you know, they're contradicting themselves all over the place. They don't know what they're doing. But they actually do know what they're doing. Okay, another uh, um, benefit of studying the Lamrim is we will comprehend all of the Buddha's teachings as personal instructions. So some people mistakenly believe that some scriptures are for study and others for meditation and practice. 
And, you know, it's right here in the long run. You hear it all the time, and people still think this way. Yeah? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I do, uh, you know, I'm doing the debate, and that stuff is for study. And then when I meditate, I meditate on Tantra. And, uh, you know, my meditation practice and what I'm studying, there are two uh, totally different things. Yeah. But His Holiness keeps emphasizing, no, that's not the correct way. Okay. When we understand the step-by-step -step approach of the Lam Rim, we see that all teachings, all the teachings relate to one or uh, relate in one way or another to subduing defilements and cultivating good qualities, and thus are relevant to our practice. Okay. So I remember when, uh, when I was at Dorji Palmo and we were studying, doing the philosophy studies at Nalanda, and uh, I thought the philosophy studies were great. I was, you know, studying low rig, and the difference between conceptual mind and non-concept, you know, direct perception, and I was looking at my mind and, you know, how often the conceptual mind was working and I wasn't really there with what I was perceiving, but, you know, there was a subsequent appearance of something else or a memory that may or may not be correct, and I was bringing it into the present and seeing, you know, whatever I was looking at now through that uh, that lens. And I thought low rig was, like, fantastic and really describing how my mind worked. And some of the other people that I was, you know, that I was studying with, they thought it was so boring, and they wanted to learn things that related to their meditation practice. They thought the philosophy was just like boring, irrelevant, you know. So, uh, yeah, so Geshe-la actually changed the curriculum at a, at a certain point uh, in order to appeal to other students. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, if you hear this and you realize, no, there's not something you study and something else you meditate on, but you really try and bring what you study into your meditation. Yeah. And I think low rig is like fantastic for doing that. I mean, talk about everybody wants to do mindfulness practice. Well, we should be mindful of all the different mental factors that arise in our mind. Yeah, mindfulness isn't just like, oh, I'm mindful of, you know, yeah, I'm inhaling, I'm in exhaling, big deal. You know, it's like, what's going on in my mind? Okay. And then here's something that uh, it really struck me when I heard His Holiness say that. He said, our mind is so complex and the afflictions are so powerful that one practice alone cannot eliminate all afflictive mental states at once. Yeah? So you hear some people say, okay, you know, I'm just going to do serenity meditation, or I'm just doing insight meditation, or I'm just doing thought training, or I'm just doing this or that. Okay? And here's His Holiness saying, don't narrow yourself just to one practice because our mind is so complicated that we need many different approaches, many different kinds of antidotes to understand our mind and to balance it and, and purify it. Okay, so just don't just, you know, I'm doing Tara practice, that's all I do. You know? Uh, the mind's very complex, he says. The stages of the path is a systematic strategy for gradually overcoming destructive attitudes and emotions by instructing us in a variety of topics and meditation techniques to develop many different aspects of our mind. Yeah. So if we want to become a wise and compassionate person, then... You know, if we just meditate on the wisdom teachings, that's not going to develop our compassion and our bodhicitta. If we just meditate 
on the bodhicitta teachings, that's not going to develop our wisdom. Okay? So we have to have a really complete practice uh, and develop all these different aspects of our mind. Although the realization of emptiness is the ultimate antidote to all afflictions, at the beginning of the path, our understanding of emptiness is too weak to be an effective remedy. Applying some of the techniques that are specific to each affliction, such as those found in the mind training teachings, enables us to subdue our gross anger, attachment, and confusion. This more pacified state of mind, in turn, is more conducive to meditating on emptiness. Okay? So, you know, where we really, you know, the end product of our meditation, we want to realize emptiness with direct perception that is a unity of serenity and insight. Okay? Now, that's going to take us a little while to generate. Yeah? So, in the meantime... We need to know other antidotes for afflictions that are specific for each affliction. The realization of emptiness will do it for its Ajax. It takes care of all the afflictions, you know. But we need something to knock down each one individually when we can't afford Ajax, okay? So... uh, You know, so then when we have anger, we meditate on on fortitude, on love. You know, when we have uh, greed, we meditate on impermanence. When we have jealousy, we meditate on rejoicing, you know, and so on. So individual uh, antidotes for individual afflictions. And those individual antidotes are much easier to learn and understand than emptiness okay so uh you know you can see it like like i know for myself okay if i get angry if i try and meditate on emptiness it's like i'm too angry to even think about emptiness yeah but if i'm angry and i think about karma and i think this is a result of my own actions yeah I'm the one under the influence of my self-centered thought that created the cause for this. So why am I getting angry? Yeah. The other bit, it's not the other person's responsibility. This is the creation of my own karma because I acted in an obnoxious way to other people in the past. You know, so if I think like that, Boy, that settles my mind right down. Yeah, because why am I angry at somebody else? It's my doing. Or another one that really helps when I'm angry, you know, because uh, Chandra Kirti talks about so much about how anger destroys so many eons of merit. Yeah. So, you know, when you're really mad at somebody, it's like you get a certain delight of being mad. I mean, it's really kind of perverted, but you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, I'm powerful because I'm mad, you know, and this guy can't stand up to me. Um, But then if I stop and think, okay, is that pleasure that I'm getting from being mad at somebody, which isn't really pleasure, but it seems like, you know, pleasure at the time because my adrenaline's going, Is that pleasure worth destroying eons of merit? Okay? Because if I'm angry, I'm destroying eons of merit, and I'm getting a little bit of a buzz for thinking I'm powerful over the other person. Okay? Now, is that worth it? When I really ask myself, yeah, Okay, let's toss out a few eons of merit, if I even have that much, for, you know, five minutes of feeling I'm powerful because I'm angry at somebody else. That's really dumb to do that. That is totally dumb. So when I think like that, then that really helps me say, what am I getting mad at, you know? It only harms me. 
doesn't do anything for the only other person. Just darns me in the long run. So forget this. Okay. So those kind of antidotes that we learn in the thought training <coughs> teachings or in the long rim teachings, you know, they're directed for specific affliction and they're much easier to understand than to say, the object of my anger is empty of inherent existence. Actually, the object of my anger is quite real. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's nothing empty about it. <laughs> okay, so, you know, later on when you're more familiar, then you can bring that up and you can see how the grasping and inherent existence and all. Okay, but it's very important to learn these other methods so that we can practice them, uh, you know, because uh, we often face the emergency of uh, a strong affliction arising, don't we? Yeah, and it isn't like, okay, there's rampant jealousy. Uh, what am I supposed to do now? I'm so jealous. What am I supposed to think about? Uh, 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 where's my book? Oh, that book doesn't talk about jealousy. I better, you know, you don't know what to do. And in the meantime, your mind is just bonkers. Okay, it's very important to learn these things. And that's why I think uh, thought training is so important, so essential. Okay. Then you calm your mind down. Then with that mind that is more in control, then if you contemplate emptiness, you know, you can understand emptiness a little bit better. The broad layout of the Lamrim enables us to understand how all the various teachings fit together in a cohesive design, in a, in a cohesive whole designed for one person to practice. This helps us to avoid pitfalls and detours and to know how to integrate all the key points of the path into our practice in a more balanced way so that we will be able to fulfill our spiritual aspirations. And I think that that point is, is very important, especially nowadays when we have so many traveling teachers you know, who come for a short period of time and the students at a center get many short teachings on many, many different topics, but they don't know how to put them together and what to practice, yeah? Because one, one week, one lama comes and teaches you Mahamudra. Okay, Mahamudra is going to be my practice. Yeah, I'm going to study my Mahamudra. That's my main practice. Then the next week, somebody comes and teaches Shanti Deva's chapter on on uh, on patience, on fortitude, and then you think, oh no, I'm going to practice the Shanti Deva, you know. And then the week after that, somebody comes and teaches Dream Yoga. Oh, Dream Yoga, fantastic! That's great. I can sleep and practice Dharma <laughs> at the same time. This is for me, okay. <laughs> And then the week after that, you know, somebody comes and teaches Nundro and doing prostrations. And you say, this is great. Now I can return my, my membership to the, to the gym and just do prostrations. Yeah. And, and then, then you say, but wait a minute. How do I put Mahamudra, Dream Yoga, um, uh, Fortitude, and Prostrations together in my practice? Because every week I'm changing my practice. And so I don't get anywhere in any of the practices I'm doing. And all those four practices seem totally contradictory. So what do I do? Breathing meditation. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Forget everything else. I'll just sit and breathe. <laughs> okay. Dharma is too confusing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why the Buddha taught breathing meditation. <laughs> okay. So if we really study the Lamrim well, then we'll see, you know, 
which teachings fit in which part of the path and what things are good to know before you practice a certain teaching and, you know, what are, you know, how all these things fit together into, uh, into a practice, okay? And what things are very advanced that you should leave for later, you know, because I mean, you just got Yamantaka initiation. Okay, drop everything else. Yamantaka is my main practice. Forget prostrations. Forget meditating on the antidotes to anger. <sighs> I'm Yamantaka. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they said choose one deity and practice that. That's me. <laughs> you know? And... And then it's like, okay, but what they said to do prostrations, but what am I supposed to do prostrations? You know, I don't, I don't know. And and then, you know, you visualize all this stuff with the and you know, and and then you know, there's there's thirty seven things that are the thirty seven harmonies to awakening. What are those thirty seven harmonies? And the walls and the mandala, you know, they're the four this and the five that. But what in the world are those things? You know, well, all I understand is, <laughs> and you go for it. Yeah. So, um, you know, if we really understand the Dharma well, then we know how to put these things together. Yeah. And we know, okay, Yamantaka is a very advanced practice for people with certain realizations beforehand. I have the commitment to do the practice every day. I will do it every day, but it's not my main practice. You know, my main practice is, well, I'm actually at the beginning of the path, so I need to do some purification, and I need to meditate on precious human life and impermanence and death. And I also have a bad temper, so, you know, I better start doing something with that. Okay, so, okay, you create a practice that is something useful for you that will help you tame your mind right now. And you, you know, you made a commitment to do that, so you do it, but you do it quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, then the next benefit of the Lamrim approach is we will discover uh, the intention of the Buddha. So the Buddha's ultimate intention was to ful fulfill all beings' aspirations for fortunate rebirth, liberation and full awakening. The structure of the stages of the path clearly illustrates how to actualize these aims. So it's very, very clear, you know, how to, these are the things you meditate on to develop uh, the wish to have a good future life. These are the practices that you do to actualize that wish. Okay, and so on for the other is spiritual aims. And then another benefit, the fourth benefit, is we will be deterred from the great error of rejecting the Buddhist teachings. Okay, so since Buddhas and Bodhisattvas teach all aspects of the path to lead diverse sentient beings to awakening, we should respect all of the Buddha's teachings. Nowadays, we unfortunately find people who criticize not only other religions, but also other Buddhist traditions. <clears throat> While debate increases our understanding, deprecating teachings that are helpful to others is not beneficial. So what he's saying is if you, we want to debate points so that we can really get to the truth, that's great. Do that debate. Discuss these things. Try and understand, you know, with somebody who's interested in learning in that way. Yeah. But don't criticize the spiritual beliefs of somebody else who, who doesn't want to learn through the debate. You know, they have their spiritual beliefs. They're practicing. Don't criticize their beliefs such that they lose their faith in whatever they have faith in, okay? And His Holiness says this even, you know, for people 
who believe things that, according to us, are wrong views. You know, so because he always talks about, you know, for some people, believing in God is really good. You know, because God said that he created people in his own image. So then these people think, okay, I should not harm other living beings because they were created in God's image. And so that helps them be ethical people, you know. So with those people, don't sit and go, you know, believing in God is totally irrational and logic, illogical and stupid. You know, that's not skillful. It doesn't help those people, Okay. If somebody wants to debate, then, yes, you can talk about, you know, okay, if you assert a creator God, then this and this and this, you know. And the other person retaliates, you know, well, if you don't assert a creator God, how do you account for that and that and that? And so with that kind of person, then that can be beneficial. But otherwise, we don't want to destroy people's beliefs. Okay. So while debate increases our understanding, deprecating teachings that are helpful to others is not beneficial. If we say we respect the Buddha and want what is best for others, how can we disparage teachings meant for disciples whose dispositions and interests differ from our own? Then the question comes, well, what about if there's a group or a person who's practicing something that is not in accord with the Buddha's teachings, but they're saying it's the Buddha's teachings. Okay. Or what about a group that is practicing something that's the Buddha's teachings, but they're also maybe doing it for the wrong motivation? Their tradition is not emphasizing the importance of motivation. What do you do then? Okay, and we encounter this, at least I encounter this quite a bit. Uh, you know, people coming and asking me questions and, and things like that and about other traditions. And it's a very, very delicate thing um, because what I found is I want to affirm what that person is practicing that is correct and accords with the general Buddhist viewpoint. But if they're also believing something that isn't correct, to be able to tactfully explain to them what the Buddha's position on this thing was, without telling them, you know, the teacher that taught you this is stupid. You know, because that's not going to help to say that to anybody. Yeah, and it's certainly not very polite. But, you know, to skillfully say, yes, you're doing this and this, and, th you know, this kind of thing, what, this is the way, this is the way my teacher taught it. Or this is the way I understand it. Um, you know, so some way to introduce a different way uh, to that person. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, I'm also very clear, I have certain ideas about secular Buddhism, okay, that I will clearly say, and at the same time, I can say for the people who believe that approach, it seems to benefit them, and it's better than them believing in something else, yeah. So I'll say, you know, okay, yeah, that's okay. But, you know, uh, actually what saying that the Buddha didn't teach rebirth, that's not actually correct. You know, you can look here, because uh, this is one of the assertions of people who do secular Buddhism. You know, the Buddha did not teach rebirth. Rebirth is not important to understand in order to be a Buddhist or to practice, you know. So they say things like that. So I'll say, you know, well, no, the Buddha did teach that. Um, but, you know, for some people, they come to Buddhism, and that's not something that makes a lot of sense to them. So put it on the back burner. Practice the Buddha's teachings that you hear that help you now. But don't throw out 
the idea of rebirth, keep it, learn about it, investigate it, come back to it later and think about it some more. Okay? So I'll say something like that to somebody who who says, well, I'm studying with so-and-so, and they say that the Buddha didn't teach rebirth. Or, you know, rebirth's not important or whatever. And so, you know, we have to find um, polite and tactful ways of helping to steer people. Yeah. Same thing with uh, people who do this protector practice that His Holiness advised not not doing, you know. And they have all sorts of wrong views about His Holiness, about, you know, different things. And so to be able to, to, you know, speak in a tactful way to them. Uh, but also realize sometimes it's very difficult to get through to them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it really depends on the individual. Yeah. Sometimes uh, I find people will call me, you know, people I don't know or whatever, they'll call me and they'll say, you know, I've been doing this kind of practice for a while with this kind of group, but now I'm feeling a bit weird about it. Uh, you know, can I stop doing that practice? What do you think about it? Or people will call me and, and say, uh, well, you know, I was with this group and they gave me a monastic ordination, but I don't know, the precepts they listed aren't like the ones that I find in, in other texts. Did I really get an ordination? Yeah, it's quite amazing. I mean, I hear all sorts of stuff, okay? And, and so to be able to talk to people and help them, if they're already questioning things, then they're seeking new information. Then it's it's very good we give them accurate information. Yeah. Um, but if you're just meeting somebody, you know, traveling on the bus, uh, then it's a different situation. Yeah. And you don't want <clears throat> to get into a big argument with them. So, uh, you know, there it may be better to... Uh, to talk with them about things you mutually agree upon, establish some trust, and then maybe over time you can introduce some other ideas to them. Yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, I can't think of one one way to, one uh, way that suits all these kind of situations. Mm-hmm. But be prepared. Yeah. I mean, some of you may have counted, encountered this kind of thing. This person who is the director of the Secular Buddhist Association says that um, that was not an assertion of theirs, mm. that there's no such thing as rebirth. There, there's there, what assertion is? That there's no such thing. Oh, okay. And, and she says, of course, Gautama Buddha taught rebirth. Uh-huh. But I went to the website and... It says that there's no um, evidence for literal rebirth. That's what their website says. She didn't say that. Uh huh. But she's saying that's not their position. Yeah. So I don't know. That person may have an individual thing, and the website says something else. I don't know. Yeah. And there's all different kinds of sex- secular Buddhists, too. So. And there was also, um, oh, another thing we ran into. Um, in Singapore, yeah, we heard there was one, uh, somebody who was doing a class at a center where I also went to teach. And the person leading the class was saying that the Mahayana teachings are not the teachings of the Buddha. So that's a, like a centuries old thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's all sorts of ways to prove the, that, the, that the Mahayana teachings are the teachings of the Buddha. Although some people accept these reasons as proof and other people say, no, they aren't proof. So prove, you know, means different things for different people. Uh, and 
you know, so somebody who was attending my teachings then went there. They heard that. They were confused. Um, you know, so we knew some other people at the centers. We kind of tried to just mention it briefly. Uh, you know, oh, we heard this person who was giving, you know, leading a class at your center is saying that. We're a bit concerned because it doesn't bring harmony amongst the Buddhist traditions. It's very confusing for people. It's much better if uh, this person, you know, because uh, there's different views of Buddhist history if they just don't teach it and they have a, a more welcoming attitude towards different Buddhist traditions. So we we said that to one of our friends and in the hope that they talk to somebody there. I don't know if they did or not. Okay. But, yeah, you encounter all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I won't tell. I should stop the storytelling. <laughs> Otherwise, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, because I started getting calls and people asking advice. and I'm, Nobody ever told me that, you know, I'd have to deal with these kind of situations. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like, oh, what do I say, you know? Yeah. Crazy stuff. So knowledge of the stages of the path enables us to understand and respect the practices of other Buddhist traditions as well as the people who engage in them. Knowing the three spiritual aims of sentient beings, fortunate rebirth, liberation, and awakening, as well as the meditations to cultivate these aims and the meditations to actualize them, we'll know where in this schema a specific teaching belongs. Okay. Yeah, okay, here's another story. This is, this is a story about how to act when you get attacked in public. Okay. <laughs> and I learned, I learned these kind of things, this this kind of thing in particular, from um, from watching Lama Yeshi, and it wasn't that people would attack him in public. People didn't do that, but people would ask a question that was like all over the place, you know, talking for like five minutes. And you still encounter this at Dharma centers, you know, talking for five minutes and, you know, oh, Buddhism talks about having visions of the Buddha. Well, what do you think, Lama, of having a vision of Jesus? Is it really Jesus? Can we really see Jesus? Or can we only see these Buddhist things? You know, are, those, are they the only ones that we can have visions of? And are they real? And, uh, you know, when I close my eyes, I have a vision of a cat. And, you know, so am I on my way to having visions of the Buddha? Should I cultivate this? This thing of, you know, my vision of a cat. And, and, but then one day, you know, a dog chased the cat. And they're all over, you know. And are these real? Is this what you mean by their empty veneer in existence? Is that the meaning of emptiness? And, you know, something like so far out. And, uh, and Lama was so amazing. He would find something that person said and talk about it and draw that person's attention to that instead of answering this question which wasn't a question but a whole stream of consciousness yeah lama would say something like Oh, you had a vision of Jesus. You know, Jesus had many qualities like a bodhisattva. We should try and cultivate compassion. You know, we should cultivate patience. We should cultivate honesty. You know, there are many similarities between Buddhism and Christianity. And so emphasize this in your practice. And, and then the person would feel so good afterwards. Yeah? So 
uh, you know, I, I, I learned that from watching. Okay, so, um, and I also learned that, that you never uh, tell somebody that they're a jerk. <laughs> you know, some people may think that you're telling them a jerk when you're trying to uh, tell them something, but you never do that, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, not that we would, I mean, we kind of try and be polite anyway. But, um, okay, so I was giving a talk at Elliot, Elliot Bookstore, Elliot Bay Bookstore in Seattle, okay? So I was reading from one of the books. You were at, the, at this when it happened? Okay. So, so I'm reading from Working with Anger. And, you know, and then some people ask questions. So one lady raises her hand, and I say yes. And she stands up and she says, what you're teaching as Buddhism is totally wrong. I belong to da-da-da-da-da tradition. And my teacher says, da 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 And what you're saying is completely not Buddhism, you know? And you need to go back and learn Dharma well before you keep giving talks like this. You know, this is, she says that in front of a crowd of people. So I stand there and I listen. And then I say, and then when she's done, I say, thank you very much. And she sits down and then I go on. Yeah, I didn't try and refute anything she said. I didn't explain myself. I just said, thank you very much. And then afterwards, when I was supposed to be signing books, people came up and they said, wow, you know, that was really something. And you just said, thank you. And, you know, they were very impressed with that. Yeah, yeah working well. Yeah, I guess. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Yeah. So those things happen, you know. People stand up and just tell you off and... What can you do? Okay. Now, two aims and four reliances. Uh, we probably... Oh. In this chapter, we have focused on the broad perspective of the long rim and how that gradually leads a person to full awakening. Now we will synthesize the path into two aims and then examine the four reliances that are important for fulfilling the Lam Rim's ultimate purpose, the attainment of full awakening. Okay, so we're focusing in on the two main aims. So Nagarjuna says in Precious Garland, due to having faith, one relies on the practices. Due to having wisdom, one truly understands. Of these two, wisdom is foremost, but faith must come first. One who does not neglect the practices through attachment, anger, fear, or confusion is known as one with faith, a superior vessel for the highest good. Okay, so as Holiness says, this verse, these verses express the two aims of the Buddha Dharma, the attainment of higher rebirth and the highest good of liberation and awakening. Attaining a higher rebirth corresponds to the initial motivation in the Lam Rim, while attaining the highest good fulfills the middle or advanced motivation. As the means to attain these, the Buddha taught two methods, faith and wisdom, respectively. The obstructions to these two goals are two kinds of ignorance, the ignorance of the law of karma and its effects, and the ignorance of the ultimate nature of reality. To eliminate these, the Buddha instructed us to cultivate understanding of two types of dependent arising, the understanding of causal dependence and the understanding of dependent designation. Okay. 
So there's a lot of sets of two there. Now he's going to tie them together. By meditating on causal dependence, we understand that our happiness and suffering arise from virtue and non-virtue. Faith is required to accept the subtle details of karma and its effects, which is an obscure, uh, which it, which are subtle details. So note this; this needs to be corrected. Which are uh, obscure phenomena that cannot be known directly for, by our senses. With trust in karma and its effects. We will reign in gross attachment, anger, fear, and confusion, and thus will cease non-virtuous actions and engage in virtuous ones. In this way, we will attain a fortunate rebirth in the future. Okay, so he's picking out one element from all these different sets of two. Okay, so if you look at the chart below, at, at the line that starts with higher rebirth, if you aim for higher rebirth, what you need to have is faith in the law of cause and effect, okay? Because if you have faith in the law of cause and effect, then you'll create virtue, you'll abandon non-virtue, you'll purify uh, non-virtue already created, and that will help you attain a higher rebirth, okay? So the obstacle that you have to pacify in order to actualize that aim is the ignorance of karma and its effects and the gross afflictions that arise out of it. What do you need to meditate on? What kind of dependent arising do you meditate on to, to overcome that ignorance and to gain faith? The causal dependence uh, leading to ethical conduct. Okay? That certain actions, that when we do them, you know, they have an ethical dimension, they will lead to these kind of results. So that gives us some faith in karma and its result, uh, results, and then we practice that and we can um, abandon, you know, or suppress the gross uh, afflictions and then get a good rebirth. Okay. Then the understanding of dependent designation leads to the realization of emptiness. That wisdom is the antidote to the ignorance of the ultimate nature and will eradicate all obscurations completely. By cultivating our understanding of the complementary nature of dependent designation and emptiness, we will be able to attain liberation and awakening. So in the chart, okay, aiming for the highest good, which is liberation and full awakening, what do we need? You know, according to that verse uh, from Nagarjuna, we need wisdom. Okay, what kind of ignorance gets in the way of our uh, attaining the highest good? The ignorance of the ultimate nature of reality, and then all the obscurations that stem from it. And then, what kind of uh, dependent arising do we need to meditate on? In order to overcome that ignorance, dependent designation complementing the realization of emptiness. Okay, is this making some sense to you? Yeah, go. You can go over this yourself and and see, and then read the section in Precious Garland. It's in the book called Practical Ethics and Profound Emptiness. There is a lot to contemplate in these two short verses by Nagarjuna. When we examine them carefully, we find that they contain the entire path to awakening. Of the two purposes for engaging in the Buddhist path, the highest good is foremost. You know, because we want, that's our ultimate objective. Okay, get out of samsara, attain full awakening. To attain it, the wisdom realizing the empty nature of phenomena is essential. This wisdom is not gained through blind belief or through prayer, but by reason. The four reliances found in the Sutra on the Four Reliances and uh, in the Sutra Unraveling the Thought guide us in doing so. So now he's going to switch and talk about the Four Reliances. Okay, which are which are talking about um, 
how to actualize the wisdom understanding the ultimate nature. Okay, so here's the four. Rely principally not on the person, but on the teaching. Two, with respect to the teaching, rely not on mere words, but on their meaning. Three, with respect to the meaning, rely not on the interpretable, interpretable or provisional meaning, but on the definitive meaning. And four, with respect to the definitive meaning, rely neither on sense consciousnesses nor on conceptual consciousnesses, but on the non-dual wisdom that realizes emptiness directly and non-conceptually. Okay, so he's going through here, you know, helping us to refine how to learn the Dharma and what are the, the uh, things that are really going to uh, remove our afflictions. So the four reliances illustrate a gradual progression in a practitioner's development. Here, rely means to mentally rely on that which is a source of reliable knowledge, non-deceptive and reasonable to trust. Throughout the path, we must rely on a teacher, learning first the words of the teaching and then understanding their meaning. So remember this. When you're studying a new topic, don't expect yourself to understand it completely the first time you hear it. He's saying, you know, we first need to learn just even the words of the teaching. You know, like, what do these words mean? And then we understand the meaning. And then we can start going deeper. Okay? So first learn the words and then understanding the meaning. Regarding the meaning, we rely first on the meaning of the interpretable teachings that describe the stages of the path and the coarser views of selflessness, and then the meaning of the definitive teachings that describe the complete view of emptiness. Okay, so interpretable teachings are teachings that are talking about the conventional truth. Okay, they're talking about people and trees, and they may negate like a permanent partless uh, independent or a permanent un unified, um, I forget how I translated it, uh, you know, uh, person, you know, so they talk about that kind of thing. And so those teachings are called interpretable because, uh, or provisional, you know, provisional because they're given in the meantime until that person becomes a suitable vessel to teach something that is more spot on and more difficult to understand. Interpretable because uh, those teachings, the actual thing that the Buddha was thinking of when he said that isn't what is obvious from the meaning. Okay, so you have to interpret and understand deeper what the words really mean. Okay, so this will keep going. It'll become clearer. Also, with the definitive teachings, they're talking about what really exists, the definitive truth, the actual truth. Okay? When with the provisional or interpretable teachings, we're talking about things that appear to exist. You know, and these appearances, these objects may appear to exist inherently, but they don't. Okay? So interpretable teachings are talking on the appearance level. Definitive teachings are talking about, you know, what actually exists. They're talking about emptiness. When we meditate on emptiness, our initial understanding is with a conceptual consciousness. Through familiarization with emptiness, we break through the veil of conception and attain direct, non-conceptual, non-dualistic perception of emptiness. <clears throat> so in when we're meditating on emptiness, first we have to get an intellectual, conceptual idea, and then later we break through the veil of that uh, conception to direct perception. 
Okay, so to explore these in more depth. So the first one, rely principally not on the person, but on the teaching. Here, person relies chiefly, refers chiefly to ordinary beings who teach many different paths that they have heard from others, misunderstood, or even made up. Okay, so the, the person could be a good teacher or a bad teacher, okay? So rather than depend on people whose minds are under the influence of ignorance, it is wiser to depend on scriptures taught by the Buddha that explain non-deceptive methods to attain awakening. Instead of using uh, this, the person who taught this is exceptional, as the reason to follow a teaching. We should apply reason to examine the words and meaning of the teaching. Okay? So we may hear lots of teachings from lots of different teachers. The teacher may be incredibly charismatic. They may have a great personality. The teachings may seem like so high and fantastic. But... If you haven't checked them out and use reasoning, yeah, you don't really know if what you're following is reasonable and the actual path that the Buddha taught. Because, you know, we all know that people can make up all sorts of things and market them, you know, 99.99 special deal for you this week. Yeah, come and learn the quick path to full awakening. Yeah, if you give $109.99, it'll be even faster Yeah, than just $99.99. Okay, so uh, we can't use, oh, this teacher is like so charming, so charismatic, so loving and fantastic. That's not a good reason for believing what somebody says. Yeah, but we are so easily taken in yeah, we really are. We're so easily taken in. And uh, this, this leads us to many problems. Even with the Buddha, not everything he said should be taken literally. Sometimes he taught a provisional view as a skillful means to lead a particular individual or group to the final path. To some people, he taught the Tathagata got to Tathagata Garba theory, which literally, which taken literally, seems to affirm the existence of a permanent self. And many people took the Tathagata Garba uh, sutras and said, the Buddha believes in a permanent self. Here it is, right in this sutra. Okay? So that's what happens if you just focus on the literal meaning of the words, okay? However, the meaning in the Buddha's mind was that the ultimate nature of the mind, its emptiness of true existence, uh, which is permanent. So the Buddha wasn't talking about a permanent self. He was talking about the ultimate nature of the mind. Its emptiness is something that's permanent. Okay. Although such teachings are not to be taken literally, they are considered non-deceptive in that the meaning in the Buddha's mind is true and reliable. Okay. The problem is the understanding in our mind is not correct. But it's said that the teachings are reliable because what the Buddha's really meaning is something non-deceptive. Similarly, when the Buddha taught nihilists that there is a self-sufficient, substantially existent person, his words are not to be taken literally. He taught this so that they would not deny karma and its effects and would understand that there is a self that carries karma to future lives and experiences its effect. Okay? So you could say, oh, why is Buddha teaching a self-sufficient, substantially existent self? He teaches that in this sutra. Then he teaches the lack of inherent existence in that sutra. The Buddha is totally confused, you know. What do we believe? Okay. So 
here is, you know, where you really have to look deeper than just what the words are. And, you know, what is the meaning of the words? And why did the Buddha teach those words? So, you know, when he said there's a self-sufficient, substantial existing person, he was saying that to a group of people who thought that there was no self at all, that there were a group of people who thought that if you say there, things are empty of inherent existence, those people fell into nihilism and thought nothing at all exists. Mm -hmm. And so then they think, well, if not, you know, then there's no person, so how can karma function? Because without there being a, a substantial person, then where, where do you place the karmic seeds? What carries the karmic seeds? Yeah. If the things are empty of inherent existence, there's no inherently existent person, then there's no way for karma to function and pass the karmic seeds to go from one month to the next. Okay, so people who have that misunderstanding to them, then the Buddha said, oh, no, there's a self-sufficient, substantial existing person. Okay. But you have to understand what he's really meaning when he says certain things. Okay. You have to dig deeper than just the words and uh, look, you know, at the meaning. So the second, so not just you know, take what the teacher says for granted, but scratch the surface. So the second uh, reliance is, so the first one was don't rely on the teacher, rely on the teaching, okay? And then the second one is with respect to the teaching, rely not on mere words, but on their meaning, okay? If we are attentive to only the words of a teaching, we may neglect its meaning. This inhibits its ability to guide us on the right path. Instead of thinking we understand a topic simply because we can use complex academic terminology and language, we should use our intelligence to understand the meaning of the teaching. We should also focus on the meaning of the Buddha's in the Buddha's mind, not on the words that can be misunderstood when taken literally. Okay? So don't just rely on the words. What's going on? What does this mean? Not only what did the Buddha mean, but what do the, the words really mean? When we want to understand the non-deceptive non mode of existence of all phenomena, Rather than rely on teachings about bodhicitta and the Buddha's qualities, okay, because those are not talking about the ultimate mode of existence. They are things talking about conventional truths, okay. You don't rely on the teachings of bodhisattva, uh, bodhicitta to learn how to meditate on emptiness, okay. You don't add cinnamon to your oatmeal if you want to add sugar, you know. Okay. Um, this wisdom has the ability to cut the root of samsara. Furthermore, we should rely on reason and cultivate reliable cognizers, non-deceptive minds that know their object correctly. While the four reliances are taught specifically in relation to realizing emptiness, the first two apply to learning any topic. Dharma talk. Don't rely on the teaching. Teacher, rely on the teaching. With respect to the teaching, don't rely just on the words. Rely on the meaning. Okay? Instead of being charmed by an ordinary person's charisma, we must listen to what he or she teaches. In addition, rather than becoming enchanted with lofty-sounding words, we must contemplate their meaning and try to understand them. So we have some work. We're going to keep going and just finish this chapter, okay? Then the third point. With respect to the meaning, rely not on the interpretable meaning, but on the definitive meaning. So interpretable meaning refers to veiled truths, which include all the objects that exist and function in the world. So when we're looking for the ultimate nature of reality, we don't want to learn car mechanics, Okay, 
Now, sure, you can say the car is empty of inherent existence, and if you do your mechanics, you're developing concentration, but, you know, that's really not the way to go about it, yeah? Okay, to understand the liberating teachings on emptiness, we must not rely on texts that speak about veiled truth, such as the defects in cyclic existence or the benefits of bodhicitta. While these teachings are important and necessary to actualize the path to full awakening, they do not express the ultimate nature. Okay. We should also avoid taking veiled truths, such as mul the multifarious objects of the senses, as the true mode of existence, but understand that they mistakenly appear inherently existent, although they are not. The meaning to rely on is phenomena's subtlest mode of existence, their mere absence of inherent existence. Since all phenomena lack inherent existence, their emptiness is called the one taste of all phenomena. Okay, so here, you know, when he's saying with respect to the meaning, rely not on the interpretable meaning, but on the definitive meaning, okay, he's, um, he's explaining it, he's bringing bringing that in in two ways okay so one is in terms of the teachings so study if you want to learn how to realize emptiness you need to study the definitive teachings not the interpretable ones you need to study the teachings on emptiness not um you know the the disadvantages of samsara and the eight worldly concerns you need to study those other topics but that's that is not going to lead you to understanding emptiness. You study them, you know, in another way. So he's saying that in terms of rely not on the interpretable, but rely on the definitive. And then he's also saying in terms of your own perception, not just what you're, the scriptures you're studying, but don't rely on your senses, because what's appearing to your senses is false and mistaken. Rely instead on a wisdom consciousness that actually directly perceives the ultimate nature. Okay? So that in, in this context, it could be uh, an inference that you're relying on. Okay, then four. With respect to the definitive meaning, which is emptiness, rely neither on sense consciousnesses nor on conceptual consciousnesses, but on the non-dual wisdom that realizes emptiness directly and non-conceptually. Okay? So don't be satisfied with a written description of what sugar tastes like. And don't be satisfied with looking at the sugar package. And don't be satisfied at being able to give a long lecture about the history of sugar and how it grows and how it's harvested and so on and so forth. He's saying, taste it. Yeah, you're only going to know sugar when you taste it. Okay, so when progressing on the path to liberation in accord with the Buddha Dharma, we should not be satisfied with conceptual understanding of emptiness, but continue to meditate until we gain an unpolluted wisdom consciousness that directly and non-conceptually realizes emptiness. From the perspective of this wisdom, there is no dualistic appearance of a cognizing, a cognizing subject, in other words, a person or a consciousness that's doing the perceiving. And there's not also the appearance of a cognized object, in this case, emptiness. Okay? Usually in all our appearances now, there's a feeling of there's me in here and the object I'm, I'm perceiving out there. My mind is here, the object is out there. Okay, that's one form of dualism. When we know emptiness directly, there's not that appearance of a, of a distinct subject and object. It, they say that they uh, are together like water poured in water. 
How that feels, I don't know. It's even difficult to imagine. Okay, ordinary beings, as well as Aryas, can have profound conceptual understanding. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, while gaining the correct conceptual uh, inferential realization of emptiness is essential, it is not the culmination of the process of realizing the ultimate nature. Ordinary beings, as well as Aryas, can have profound conceptual understanding, but we must seek to gain an Arya's non-conceptual wisdom that arises in the wake of analytical meditation on emptiness. <coughs> to do this, we must look beyond the appearances to our sense consciousnesses and to our conceptual mental consciousnesses of the aggregates and so forth that are the substrata of emptiness. Okay, so we're not looking at this you know, the bookmark and the body and all these things, yeah. They're the substrata of emptiness. That is, the objects whose ultimate nature is the emptiness of inherent existence. Okay, so we're not focused on those objects. What we're looking at is their emptiness, okay. This mind knows its ultimate, uh, its own ultimate nature, did I skip something? Yeah, I did skip, didn't I? Instead, we must cultivate a direct, yogic, reliable cognizer of emptiness, a mind that perceives emptiness free of conceptual appearances. This mind knows its own ultimate nature. <clears throat> emptiness directly appears to this mind, and the mind non-conceptually ascertains it. At this time, the appearance of subject and object ceases, and the mind and emptiness become undifferentiable, like water poured into water. The progression illustrated by the four reliances indicates that we must not be complacent with one level of understanding, but continue until we gain direct experience of the path and actually free our minds from defilements. Okay, so you may need to go over this section about the four reliances and contemplate it, yeah, to really understand what His Holiness is saying, because uh, he, he explains something and he brings in different things from different positions. Two questions about this. The first one is the sutras these are from, or Mahayana sutras, but... The sutra what? The sutras that these are from are Mahayana sutras, but the, yeah. the but the second one is is from the mind only school, right? Yeah. And the first one. The the first one, uh, yeah, the sutra of the four alliances. I don't know which which viewpoint it it uh, emphasizes, but the sutra unraveling the thought. The Majjhimikas talk about it a lot. Mm. It's not that it presents only the Yogacarya view. Yeah, certain portions of it explain that, but there's much more in the sutra unraveling the thought. Okay. Yeah. And then it's quite confusing to me, this one sentence that says, the four reliances illustrate a gradual progression in a practitioner's development uh, the next sentence actually here rely means to mentally rely on that which is a source of reliable knowledge non-deceptive and reasonable to trust but it's referring to things that you're later going to refute um no it's looking at why you believe something you know so the first one is rely uh rely principally not on the person but on the teaching okay so it's, um, you know, okay, the teacher may or not, may or may not be somebody reliable to teach, but the only way you're going to find that out is if you rely more on the meaning, yeah, than the teachings and not the teacher's personality. Yeah. Then in terms of relying on the teaching, yeah, don't just look at, you know, are there nice examples and poetic language and 
Uh, it's easy to understand and things like that. But look at what is the meaning that the Buddha is trying to get across. That is something that uh, is more reliable, that is more going towards a reliable cognizer. Exactly. Including the next one? Including the next one? With respect to the meaning, rely not on the interpretable meaning, but on the definitive meaning. So if you're wanting to realize the ultimate nature of reality, yeah, uh, so we left off, yeah, I want to understand the meaning, but what do you need to understand the meaning of? Okay, is understanding how to bake bread going to lead you to realizing emptiness? Is understanding, um, you know, the Sigalavada Sutra, which teaches about family relationships, going to lead you to a view of emptiness? No, you have to study the, the definitive teachings. Okay? Right. And then when you're studying the definitive teachings, are you going to rely on your sense consciousnesses to know emptiness? Are you going to rely ultimately on your, uh, your conceptual inference to know emptiness? No, you wanted to, to rely on the deeper wisdom, the non-dual wisdom. I think what I find confusing is how do you, where do the grosser levels of the self fall into this, like the, um, like they're interpretable. Yeah, they're they're the interpretable but teachings. You, but you rely on them to get to the deeper meaning, yeah. more subtle. You may rely, yeah, because. You have to start negating some kind of concrete soul. Yeah? You have to start there. If you have that notion of a concrete soul, you got to start there. And then you get more deeper and deeper. You know, that's why, you know, in studying the uh, tenant systems, we, we start studying the tenant systems that are most like our ordinary views and then gradually start refuting more and more. Someone online is asking whether the last two reliances could apply to any Lam Rim meditation or topic. Um, many of the Lam Rim meditations are the interpretable meaning. Yeah, precious human life, death and impermanence, ref, you know, uh, for, for the, well, you know, refuge and the four truths, they have elements in there of understanding emptiness, but if you're just studying them, you know, on the, uh, in the Lam Rim on the elementary level, yeah, the dissatisfac uh, unsatisfactory aspects of samsara, all the bodhicitta teachings, all these Lam Rim teachings are the ones that are on the provisional or interpretable level. That doesn't mean that they're unnecessary for the path. Okay, it doesn't mean they're useless or they're bad. It just means that those teachings are not talking about the ultimate nature of reality. Okay, the definitive teachings are talking about that. I just want to really thank you for writing this chapter especially. Um, it helps me make sense of my own experience learning. When I first came to the Abbey, the key topics we were studying were tenets and low rig. And after that, we did Arya Deva's 400 stanzas. And for a long time, I was like, am I stupid or what? It's like, they're speaking English and I don't understand. I think what got me to class was um, un faith in the teacher. You know, like these people have dedicated their lives to the Dharma. They're not going to teach us anything off base, like just show up and get an imprint. Mm -hmm. um, but because thankfully we have Lam Rim in the morning and evening and you were teaching us thought training every day in the BBCs, that was like the rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, after some time I realized, okay, this is, this, is, this is like middle scope and above or tenets is advanced, okay? Like mm -hmm. you're not stupid. <laughs> you just need to focus on the initial scope now and that will come later. Mm -hmm. And that was very helpful yeah. over time. Yeah. So yes, for, for the brand new people, it's like, ah, it's right. so helpful to have this, to know like, okay, know where things fit and, and know what you need right. to focus on. Right, yeah. And know when you're studying bodhicitta, you know, don't think, you know, oh, I haven't realized emptiness, uh, but I've been doing the loving kindness meditation. How come? You know, well, no, loving kindness meditations to 
generate loving kindness. It's, it's not to realize emptiness. But also, regarding the 400 stanzas, the first eight chapters, yeah, are more, uh, you know, they're in interpretable topics. Okay, And actually, some of the last ones are too, because they're teaching, uh, you know, they're refuting permanent self and stuff like this. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah, you walk into something and then you can go, boy, you know, I'm, I, I must be really dumb. What in the world are they ta these people talking about? Okay, they're all writing notes. They all look like they're understanding, but, you know, <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> don't be fooled. <laughs> uh-huh. I find it really interesting that you found... Uh, Lama Yeshe's ability to take a stream of consciousness question <laughs> and find value in it, that that helped you when you're being publicly attacked. I think for me, I wouldn't be able to link the two because I used to make sense of, you know, children's questions and uh -huh. find something in it that would, you know, not embarrass yeah. them. And so I'm just wondering if you recall what was going on internally that... Uh, it was just like, it was like what this person was saying was like, you know, one of those stream of consciousness questions. It's not something that I should even try and answer because whatever I answer I give is not going to be suitable for that person. That's yeah. very helpful for me yeah. to hear when it's going to happen to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because whatever I would have said to her, you know, it would have just started an argument. She she didn't have it. You know, there was no ability to, to to take in some new information from a different perspective. So the best thing to say was thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. I also like the four liabilities very much. They um teach um, how to become a responsible student. Yeah. And I remembered um, one story I heard uh, many years ago um, from um, about Atisha and his student, um, Tom Temper. Mm -hmm. And Tom Temper um, was um, taking care of Atisha when he was at the moment of death. Mm -hmm. And um, he started to cry and some tears fall off and um, on the face of Atisha. And Tisha asked, what uh, is going on with you? And then, uh, why are you crying? And then Tom Turnper said, um, you are, um, when you are dying, I don't have anybody to rely upon. And uh, Tisha said, no, you have the teachings to rely upon. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to say that the Lamrim first two scopes, I would see them as uh, purification practices to clear the mind of the obstacles to be able to realize emptiness. So the, the deeper I understand karma, the disadvantage of cyclic existence, to start transforming my mind into a more mm -hmm. virtuous state. It's mm -hmm. almost like I'm preparing the soil to be able to, to understand the definitive teachings later on. So mm -hmm. they're really more of preliminary, getting the mind ripe for yeah, like Yeah, in one way you can see that, and I think that's very much how the Lamrim was written. Uh, in this series... I wanted to present the the middle path because it's said that it's a it's a full complete path for somebody who's following it. But in the regular Lamrim teachings, it, the the middle scope is like this big, you know, it's tiny, and it's not expanded. And you if if you don't know the teachings well, you can't see how that is a full path for somebody who's aiming for liberation, because they don't explain everything. Yeah, they just mention the names and say, it'll be explained later. So in this series, in volume four, yeah, volume four, then we um, have to <laughs> make sure I'm getting the right volumes here. Okay, so this is the one that's going to come out soon in, in the autumn. Um, so that one goes into the uh, the true paths very, very deeply. Yeah. So in just instead of just saying, oh, yeah, there's uh, the higher training in ethical conduct, concentration, and wisdom, 
and leave it like that, you know, what I did is I took the Theravada view of how to develop concentration and the uh, Maitreya's view and put, you know, explain both of them in, in that sequence, you know, instead of leaving it for the far reaching, uh, instead of leaving it for the perfection of meditative stability. And then in explaining the, the higher training of, uh, in wisdom, talked about the 37 harmonies with awakening, especially the, uh, the four establishments of mindfulness, because that's actually a wisdom practice. But they just, you know, they just say, oh, the, yeah, in middle scope you do the, you do the, you know, the higher training in wisdom, and now we're going to talk about the higher scope and develop bodhicitta. But, you know, if it's going to be a full path, you have to bring, uh, show what teach what those teachings are and how they express wisdom and how you can realize wisdom through uh, doing the four establishments of mindfulness. Okay, so in this series, it was, you know, that was one way in which we made it uh, different from the usual long rim. Because otherwise, you know, you read 20 pages and you say, oh, that, that's the whole path for somebody who wants to attain liberation? <laughs> yeah? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But seen from the view of the Lam Rim, where the person they're talking to is somebody who, who wants to be a bodhisattva and do that path, then explaining it like that has reason. But His Holiness said with this series, he didn't want it just to be another Lam Rim book. He wanted the teachings of the other Buddhist traditions put in. So I wanted to really show how those, those other traditions, you know, have incredible teachings in them that the, are not contradictory, that actually help us in our practice, that are in the, you know, the Sanskrit tradition, but are not brought off. People just mention them and then go on to the next thing and really miss out on a lot of wonderful stuff that can help our practice. Yeah, so it's, it's talking for those people. Hmm? Yeah, I remember when I had asked His Holiness to, um, at one point, explain the four establishments of mindfulness. Yeah, because, well, you know, where, where are you going to read about it? You can find it in a Theravada book. Yeah, you find the outline in, uh, in Jason Kappa's uh, Gumpa Rapsal, but where do you find an explanation on how to meditate? You know, there was, there was one thing Jason Chucky Gelson had, yeah, but it wasn't, a, you know, it was it's beautiful, and that's what the, was the basis for that chapter. But I needed a teaching on it. And then, you know, you study the actual teachings coming from the Theravada tradition, and it really expands it too. And then you realize, wow, you know, this is quite some practice, and it would re be really helpful to get some familiarity with this practice before I, you know, start meditating on Tantra. <laughs> yeah. So gain some mindfulness of what this body is before you start visualizing yourself having another kind of body. Yeah. <laughs> and what's the difference between this body and a deity's body? Mm -hmm. This will be the last question. I, I met one teacher, um, Chetsang Rinpoche from the Kakyo tradition. He actually is teaching it. Mm -hmm. he, um, he translated it. Um, into Tibetan and made it available. And um, he is teaching the four establishments before he's teaching Tantra, or he's intermingling it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very good. As when His Holiness was pulled out the text and was starting to teach this, and he just kind of said, "You know, when you study the, the, you know the. No." Ornament Clear Realizations is a bunch of lists of different topics. He said, uh, 
when you study the the Pali Sutras, you know, the actual fundamental vehicle sutras, he said you really get the feeling of the Buddha as a human being and how he dealt with different situations. Yeah. And then he talked about uh, the four establishments and saying, you know, it's really too bad in our tradition that people don't spend more time on this. It's written in the book. You should, those of you who did proofreading, uh, maybe you ran across it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs>